Thank you, Alex, and thanks everybody for coming after lunch and for the organizers for inviting me. Yes, I'll tell you what uh, these uh, neuromorphic architectures are. Uh, before I start and go into the details, I just put this slide up because the time is very short. I just want to um, make sure. Sorry, just let me get rid of this. Make sure the people that did the work get the credit. So I work with Rodney Douglas, the director of, or founder of the institute, and my postdocs, Ning and Yulia, and students that are now postdocs elsewhere, and uh, with collaborators from outside, <coughs> including Sabina, uh, whose talk we heard earlier today. So neuromorphic computing. You know, the term neuromorphic is very popular today. Uh, in the last few years, it became really popular. It got a lot of press. There is very big projects, Human Brain Project, the Synapse <coughs> DARPA initiative that was a few years ago. <clears throat> it's mainly related to the hardware implementation of brain-inspired computing platforms. It's dedicated hardware, but it's using uh, the, the, the neuromorphic computing literature that you find now is using conservative approaches, meaning that it's either uh, digital, for example, using ARM cores, or uh, above threshold if people are doing analog, or fully digital in case of true north of IBM. The goal of these more recent neuromorphic computing approaches is that of doing high performance computing. For example, building uh, fast computing platforms for neuroscientists that can simulate, simulate neural networks really quickly, or for doing uh, inference in, uh, in neural networks. In fact, uh, there is a lot of interest in, in doing uh, applications you know, for deep networks and, cell and convolutional neural networks. And you see here examples. I mean, even, even GPUs are starting to be denoted as neuromorphic computing platforms. It's, it's, as I said, it's became very popular. But the, the whole field actually started many, many years ago in the late 80s, mid 90s, by Carver Mead and Misha Mahowald. Misha was a biology student at Caltech. Carver is an uh, electrical engineer at Caltech. And together, they proposed to use silicon, the physics of silicon, uh, using all the full range, not just digital, also analog, to directly emulate the physics of neural systems. So this is, this is not uh, application driven. It's really a, a basic research question that has been going on and it's still going on for, for many, many years. And some of the old people like me, who was also at Caltech at the time, are carrying on with this tr tradition, which is quite different from this one, even though the term now is, is, is the same. So I'll tell you more about this part here, the, the old neuromorphic approach. And uh, both, uh, neuromorphic actually became very popular because it addresses the problem of designing computing systems that are very, very low power. And if you look at the brain, the brain is a very nice example. I took this slide from IBM uh, that shows that, you know, if, if you look at the power density, brains are really orders of magnitude away from conventional technologies. And even if you look at biology, uh, there are existing proofs that you can have marvelous technologies that can carry out computation with very small volumes, very small power. Even a bee uh, has a brain that has, is one milligram, one millimeter cube in volume. It has less than a million neurons with very low power. And with this technology, bees uh, uh, compute uh, with uh, variable and uh, unreliable processing elements, which are extremely slow. We heard yesterday that for current technology, speed is a requirement. For brains, speed is not a requirement. Actually, going slow is a requirement. And I'll show you that you can do robust computation, low latency robust computation, so fast, by using slow parallel elements. And uh, brains and, and bees, they can compute using massively parallel distributed computation, local connectivity. Brains also have the problems that we have in technology. Wiring is a big problem. Uh, we do have 3D, but still uh, brains uh, are optimal for minimize, minimizing wiring. And uh, with this technology, these uh, you know, marvels that we also have in our brain, can do real-time interaction with the environment. They can do complex spatial temporal pattern recognition. Even with less than a million neurons, you can have cognitive behaviors. You can have foraging, navigation, social behaviors. It's really impressive. And uh, the point is that we have the te even with the memoristic technologies that we saw this morning, we have technologies to implement the components. We actually still need to do a lot of basic research to understand how to connect these things and how to program them to obtain these types of uh, performance out of it. So the original neuromorphic computing approach that I told you comes from Carver Mead and Misha Mahol from the 80s, really is aimed at building artificial neural processing systems that can interact intelligently with the physical world. So it's just important to point out, we're not trying to recognize as cats from dogs 
that are downloaded from a Google database. Everything here is physical. It's, if it's software and virtual, then it's not this type of uh, research that we are doing also in Zurich. And uh, in order to actually develop these technologies, which are supposed to complement and not replace standard computing technologies, uh, I'm going to walk you through four important steps. And uh, the most important one is, is to follow an interdisciplinary approach. Uh, it's really important to understand what we are trying to emulate. So it's really important to study neuroscience, neurophysiology, neuroanatomy, uh, the physics of computation and computer science, theory of computation. And of course, we want to implement these in physical systems that are efficient. So we also need to do physics and, and electrical engineering. What Carver also was saying, he was saying, listen to the silicon. If you want to squeeze out every picojoule out of your computational device, you cannot use it in a, just a digital mode where you abstract. You really have to use all of the physics of the device to carry out computation. And uh, now I would say it's not just the silicon, listen to the device physics. We've heard this morning really beautiful examples of devices that can be used to implement synaptic functions, synaptic dynamics, or neural dynamics. The other really important part is that, uh, which is not used in standard computing technologies, is that in brains and in these types of neuromorph neuromorphic systems, time represents itself. And if you, if you just give up the idea of virtualizing time, this will free you of many constraints and impose many other constraints that will show you how to develop efficient computing systems. And in the end, as I said, brains are not just general purpose computers. They are there to interact with the environment, interact intelligently with the physical world. So it's also important when we build artificial systems to build them with the goal of uh, producing behavior, of uh, creating autonomous agents that can produce behavior. Autonomous agents can be robots, but they can be IoT, intelligent sensors in the rooms. They can be small devices that are, are in our blood and, and measure metabolites and take decisions. So you, you should think of autonomous agents as a broad category of intelligent devices, not just uh, uh, roving robots. Now, um, let's look at uh, how to exploit device physics to directly emulate the biophysics of neural systems. I told you there is already a lot of expertise in the room for exploiting the physics of memoristic devices. If we go back to CMOS, what Carver was pointing out, is that even transistors can be uh, very efficient devices if you use them, first of all, in the full analog range, but uh, if you use them in the sub-threshold range where you have um, gate to source voltage differences which are below the threshold voltage, in that region you get exponential behavior. So on a semi-log plot, that's what you get because of diffusion and Boltzmann statistics. And if you look at what uh, Hodgkin and Huxley were measuring, there, there was the slide by Leon this morning when they got the Nobel Prize for, for understanding how the action potential generation mechanism in, in neurons works, they were measuring exactly the same type of curves. Uh, looking at the current through sodium and potassium channels. And again, you have Boltzmann statistics and diffusion. So you can understand if you have the analogies at the microscopic level with single channels, whether it's a proteic channel or a transistor channel, once you start building circuits with more and more of these devices, you will observe analogies also at the macroscopic scale. You'll get logs, exponentials, uh, rectification, half-wave half rectification, and, and so on. So that's why if you build neural systems using the devices in this domain, you can really get a lot out of them with very low power. The other point was time represents itself. If you want to do uh, brain-inspired computation, it's really important to, to use this notion. And uh, that means that when we produce chips that have synapses and neurons, we don't have the luxury of time stamping everything, putting them in some data bank, doing some processing, going and getting it back, and keep on doing processing. We really have to process data as it's coming through the system. Once we get sensory inputs, you know, audio, video, temperature, it has to go through the system. The system has to have time constants that are well matched to the time constants of the data that's going through. So in the case of speech, for example, we have to have time constants here that are the orders of milliseconds. So we have to slow down silicon. We have to have circuits that can have time constants of tens, hundreds of milliseconds. And, uh, and in that case, if time represents itself, you don't need to, to use extra memory and extra bandwidth for that. So that's why, again, another way of getting extra, very low power. Especially if you have low, slow circuits, you have low currents, low voltages, microwatts, nanowatts, and you have low bandwidth. So again, you save power also for that. The other point is uh, how to do robust computation in, in real-time behaving systems. To do robust computation, again, there's extra steps. You, you need, first of all, to understand how to design circuits efficiently, how to do good circuit design, and uh, use uh, analog and digital, asynchronous digital. So this type of work is going beyond the standard logic design flow that 
typically is done in Silicon Valley with CMOS. Uh, in, because we're using analog circuits, they're noisy. Because they're subthreshold transistors, there's a huge amount of mismatch. So we have to understand how to do robust computation using the same tricks that biology uses, using adaptation and learning. And we've seen this morning that uh, there are many devices now that can help uh, for non-volatility and for reproducing the properties of real synapses. So we can use those to go beyond standard CMOS technologies. The other point, if we, if we don't virtualize time and if we do computation as data is going through the system, we need to have state and computation in the same place. The synapse that's receiving the data is supposed to act on the data as it's going through. So by, by construction, these systems have co-localized memory and computing. So we're going beyond standard von Neumann architectures. We, we need to. It's not like a design specification. It's a requirement from the representation that we're using. And finally, another point that I won't have time to go into, but it's probably the most important one, is that uh, once we have these parallel uh, elements of, with, uh, that express nonlinear dynamics, synapses and neurons, we need to understand how to program them. How do you get a spiking neural network, whether it's real or physical or, or electronic, to do a procedural task, if, then, else, you know? And uh, it's, uh, it's extremely complicated. It requires computer science and computational neuroscience. We have to go beyond the standard programming paradigms, but we need to understand how to build compilers that can produce behavior. And uh, there is interesting, uh, promising work from uh, our colleagues already from uh, 10 years ago showing that using the, the formalism of finite state machines. So if you, if you give a finite state machine diagram, it's possible to map that onto networks of spiking neurons, and it's possible to implement those on the chips that you will see. And so we can really then program behavior and formal procedures by, by using these parallel uh, elements which are neurons and synapses. So I'll go again through these uh, three steps here, how to do efficient signal analog, mixed signal analog digital neuromorphic circuits. Uh, I'll show you examples of learning uh, circuits, and uh, I'll show you a chip that has co-localized memory and computing. So for, for the mixed signal, I'll just use two examples. I'll just go through quickly some circuits. This is a, a current mode log domain uh, integrator. It's called the differential pair integrator. He, you see the differential pair. It's receiving voltage spikes, the pulses, which can be even a few hundred nanoseconds wide. And it's producing output currents that have time lengths as long as you know, 100 milliseconds. That's because we have picofarad capacitors. We have pico, pico amp currents. That's how we get the long time constants. So we really need to slow down silicon. Everything is passive. If there is no data coming in, there is no current flowing through. There is no, no power being burned. So this is really. Uh, if you have a signal, you, you burn power. If you don't, you don't have an op amp, so you really save. It's extremely low power. And this is data from the chip. You know, you can change the parameters of the, of the circuit. For example, the voltage that determines the synaptic weight, and you get different impulse responses. Um, you can change the time constant by changing other parameters. If you look at real synapses, this is data measured from a real synapse, you see that you have the same type of dynamics. You have tens of milliseconds. The scale here is 10 milliseconds, the same type of dynamics. Here we have more current. We have nanoamps, and here you have picoamps, but we're close to what you see in biology. And because everything is subthreshold, you have exponential relationships between currents and voltage, it's really easy to derive analytically the transfer function of the circuit. You just write the transistor equations, Kirchhoff's current laws, and you can really get to the output transfer function quite, quite easily. This is a synapse. You can do the same for a neuron. You just need to put a bit more transistors together. But you can, if you really study the circuit, you can find leak conductance type circuits, sodium activation and sodium inactivation channels, potassium reset channels, calcium adaptation channels. So you can really go and look at every single transistor channel and find the analogy in a proteic channel in a real neuron. And uh, again, you can derive the equations. You can find that this is a two variable dynamical system, like Idzikovich neurons, except that this is an uh, adaptive exponential integrated and fire neuron. You can see the exponential part here. This is, again, data measured from the chip fitted with these equations for a single spike. If you inject current, if you have adaptation, you can get uh, more, more uh, realistic spikes, like bursting behavior, chattering spikes, all of the things that also Idzikovich shows in his papers, spike frequency adaptation. And now we have synapses and neurons. You can put them together. You have spikes coming into the input synapse. The synapse produces a current, which comes into the neuron. The neuron produces spikes in output. You can create networks. And uh, if, you, if you look at the input rate of the spikes and the output rate of the spikes, you can create these FF curves. 
and you see that you have a transfer function of a, whole, of a full neuron, synapse plus soma. And by changing the weight of the synapse, you can change the slope. By changing the parameters, you can get sigmoids. <coughs> you can get uh, ReLUs, rectified linear units. Uh, you, you can implement spike frequency adaptation, refractory periods. It's really flexible just by changing the parameters of the circuit. This is data from a chip that had a few hundred neurons. And you also what you see here is that there is variability. And uh, there is about 20% mismatch. So even if you apply the same exact inputs to the neurons, they, be, they respond with frequencies that uh, are variable. And uh, you should think of this as a feature and not of a, as a bug. The point is that you want to try to find methods of programming these systems that can exploit the variability and rather than being uh, hindered by it. And fortunately, from theory, theor uh, theoretical neuroscience, there is many of these algorithms that actually can take advantage of this variability. So we don't have to worry about it. We actually need it to do computation reliably. So, so much for the neuron and synapses. Uh, I told you if you want to um, cope with the variability and obtain robust computation, you need to implement adaptation and learning. Learning circuits have also been proposed. There is a vast body of literature on spike timing dependent plasticity learning algorithms, both from uh, theory from neuroscience and from computer science. Uh, in the le uh, latest years, maybe in the last five to two years, there's been many uh, proposals of circuits that go beyond standard spike time independent plasticity. There are algorithms that look at the arrival of the input spike, which you have here, and uh, the state variables of the post of the output. And depending on the state variables, whenever you, you receive an input spike, you decide whether to increase or decrease the weight. So there is this theory that has this prescription, which is very nice for VLSI. It requires bistable synapses. You don't need 32-bit floating point to explain biology. You, you just need to show that either there is a strong synapse or a weak synapse. For, for circuits, it's really nice because you can use uh, flip-flops or just you know, one bit. Because of this uh, bistability uh, requirement, you also need redundancy. And in VLSI, we can have redundancy. We can put many, many synapses on chips. And the other point is that you need stochasticity. So you need to embrace stochasticity. It's something that we've seen um, this morning. We've seen yesterday in, in, with Alisa in, in Wi-Fi, in uh, DRAM, in Honor. So there is also from the electrical engineering community, the real, uh, people are realizing that you can actually exploit stochasticity to do computation. And theoretical neuroscientists are also telling you, if you want to explain the data from the brain, you need to use stochasticity as a way of computing. And uh, from the point of view of circuits, we, we can design circuits that are event-driven, so they, they act whenever there are spikes, like with the synapse that I showed you. Uh, these, these don't need overlapping pulses, like many of the old STDP circuits. And they are extremely low power. Their current mode, there is no active circuits. We've shown that you can implement unsupervised learning with the, these chips, supervised learning, reservoir computing, liquid state machines, uh, attractors, uh, Hopfield networks, convolutional networks. There is many uh, examples. I don't have time to go, to go into them. But um, if you're interested, you can look at these papers here. Uh, as uh, Sabina was showing this morning, the, these types of circuits are also uh, optimally suited for memristive devices. We don't have yet chips with memristors integrated on them, but we have been doing experiments where we can connect from pads uh, memristive devices outside, and we can implement LTP or LTD transitions, so long-term potentiation, long-term depression transitions. And we can get these dynamics also if we use memristors. Finally, the colloquially, now we have synapses, neurons, learning. How do we put everything together and have these non von Neumann architectures that have colocalization of memory and computing? Well, we just need to integrate all of these things in VLSI. And uh, we've been doing these chips for many, many years, starting from Caltech in the 90s. The latest one that we did, uh, we taped out in December, we should be getting it back in a few weeks, is a 28 nanometer FDSOI with an ST process. Uh, which has five cores. It has uh, four cores with 256 neurons each that are programmable, that don't have learning, and one core that has learning. So here are the characteristics of the chip. Uh, there are many, uh, so these are test circuits. The actual the neural processor chip is this one, and their characteristics are here. You, you, you start to have the technology that allows you to put many neurons and many synapses on them, so you can start to do interesting computational tasks with them. And if you compare them to standard uh, processors, like this is the latest Intel uh, i7, you'll immediately notice that we don't have this von Neumann architecture where you have memory on one side and computation in the other. The cores, I'll show you, are the memory chips. This is memory. It's just memory with computation at the same time and also here. At the same time, 
uh, all of these uh, neurons here have parallel I.O. and we have multiple parallel I.O. pathways. So it's such that we don't have, uh, we don't have a memory bottleneck, but we don't have an I.O. bottleneck. If you have two retinas sending data in, the spikes will come from one side and the other. If you have two cochleas, the spikes will come in parallel from the other side. So you really, you can start processing data in parallel because we have many, many input pads that are sending the data in. And if you look at the memory and, and memory and computation, I just want you to realize if you, for example, zoom in in one of the cores, you see that the, these neurons are actually quite small analog circuits, and the large bulk of it is uh, TCAM and SRAM cells. And the, these uh, memory elements are actually being used to do computation. So memory and computation is, is localized. There is no single memory bank with one bus. There are many distributed buses all around the chip that are sending data through uh, directly to the computation. So we don't move data far away. We, we move data only just next to the neurons so that we can do processing. And again, that's how we get low power. Uh, and this is also to point out that um, if we were to replace these TCAM cells and SRAM cells with memristive devices here, we could increase the density by you know, a factor of at least 10. Because these are six transistor cells, if we can just replace it with one nanoscale device, we can really shrink things down a lot. Uh, so we, these, this type of technology, even though it's using standard CMOS circuits, is ideal for integration with resistive memories for just you know, storing data. It's ideal for integration with synapses, memristive synapse circuits, for doing non-volatility and learning. And it's ideal for 3 d BLSI integration, because you can imagine you can have capacitors on a second layer, and then you can use really this um, monolithic 3D technology that is being developed in, in Cialetti, for example. Finally, one of my, uh, my last slides, I'd just like to conclude that um, we, can, we have been using these chips, as I said, for many years, and we can actually program them. That was the thing that uh, I didn't have time to talk to, but we did understand how to program them, how to reproduce what is observed in biology, perceptual bistability. For example, if you look at the two, fa two um, faces looking at each other, it's either a vase or two, fa or two faces, you will, your perception will flip, and we can have uh, the perception of the chips flip in the, with the same dynamics. We can use them to do decision making, inference, Q integration, function approximation. Everything has been demonstrated with real experimental data. We can use them to do constraint satisfaction problem solvers. For example, the Sudoku or traveling salesman problem or the three sub problems. This is standard benchmarks that are using in this domain. The neural state machines also, we have actually used chips to reproduce uh, cognitive behavior, for example, we showed the, uh, an experiment to the chip that is exactly the same that the monkeys follow, and the, the, we program the chip to reproduce the same dynamics of monkey data. So we can really program chips to reproduce the same type of behaviors. Uh, we did a very s simple demonstration of uh, convolutional networks, and we have examples now of robots moving around, being controlled by the chips with no computers at all in the loop. It's just motors and uh, spiking neurons that are like a Breitenberg vehicle that is driven by spikes that can avoid obstacles, follow targets. And you see here uh, examples of uh, spikes. Every dot here is a spike of one neuron. Each population of neuron is directly connected to the motor. So if the silicon retina makes the neuron spike in one, in one part of the chip, that part of the chip will make the motor turn in the other direction. So you can either follow or avoid targets. So you, you can really now start to have behavior without having to program anything. You can just connect populations of neurons to sensors and to motors and get behavior. And finally, uh, I have the conclusions with some discussion items because I, I have to leave some minutes for discussion. So we, meaning the neuromorphic engineering community at large, both the, the one that comes from uh, Caltech, there's about you know, 10, 12 groups in the world doing this type of uh, research, plus all the new wave of neuromorphic um, computing researchers have made lots of progress and we are now starting to see that we can do uh, real computation with chips, not just toy examples. Um, our basic research efforts, there's still a long way to do, go, but we are actually going towards the construction of architectures that uh, are beyond standard CMOS. So we use analog and asynchronous digital. We're going beyond the standard von Neumann architectures and beyond standard CMOS technologies, thanks also to the work that is being done, for example, presented in this workshop. The discussion items I'd like to bring up are the fact that 
uh, if people say, you know, we have to do brain-inspired computation to achieve low power, you really need to understand what, what you want to do. And if you want to follow the same principles of the brain, you have to understand the same principles of the brain. It's, it's very hard for engineers to get equations from somewhere and then get uh, magically low power. You really have to study neuroscience to understand where are the trade-offs, what are the things you can do with silicon that reproduces the, th the things you can do in biology. And this, for example, also following a cytomorphic approach is something we've seen yesterday was, is really inspiring. Brains are not general purpose processors. They, are, they, they have been deeply optimized to carry out different tasks. If you look at insects, this is very clear. But even if you go up to mammals, uh, you'll realize that you know, we are not um, matrix multipliers. We cannot do spreadsheets. We, we can do things very well, but they have been optimized through evolution to do very specific things. And so again, you cannot think of doing brain-inspired computation to replace general purpose computers. And also, you have to look at the power budget. There is no free lunch. If you, have, if you talk about microwatts, you have to target applications that can deal with microwatt processing. If you want to do uh, high performance computing, you will have to burn power. You will have to need have data to go through very fast and you will have to burn power. So it's, it's very unlikely that there will be a brain inspired low power architecture that will be able to do MNIST with 99.8 accuracy. Which brings me to the last point, accuracy is overrated. If you talk to machine learning people, they will always tell you, oh, but here you have imprecise computation, it's useless. It's not useless if you have feedback. If you have a robot that has to reach for a target, for example, I cannot tell you this is uh, the distance between here and the bottle is uh, 56 centimeters, 0.3, because my um, sensory system and computation system is very inaccurate. But if I have feedback and I can do uh, iterative refinement, I can reach for it extremely well and, and, um, and be very precise in reaching for, for targets. So accuracy is, is not something that should, should worry us if we are talking about systems that interact with the environment in real time. And it's always a matter of debate with machine learning people that say forget about this because you're not 99.98% accurate when you're doing the MNIST benchmark. And uh, then finally, let me just thank again all the collaborators and thank, thank you for your attention. <laughs>